Good day, everybody. Welcome to The Professors. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier. And it's a delight to have you joining us here in Abilene, Texas, at the campus of McMurray University. And Dr. Frazier, you history guy, we're beginning something, I think it's called Texas High Holy Days or uh, something like that. We brought an expert on Texas High Holy Days today. This is Dr. Steve Harden, also on faculty here at McMurray University and flanked by Scott the Engineer, which keeps everything rolling and on an even keel. We're so glad you're here, Scott. And I'm Steve glad Harden. you're glad. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad. And, and Steve Harden, welcome to our podcasting. Is that the right word, podcasting? I think it's a show. Okay, the show. That's right. Oh, y'all so, wear me out. So I, I I'm uh, true to it, man. <laughs> so we're going to begin by talking about. First of all, do I have the right name? The Texas High Holy High Days. High Holy Days or Alamo High Holy Days. Uh, it, it it began several years ago uh, among Alamo enthusiasts. Wait, wait. Alamo enthusiasts? Uh, that's correct. There, what, what, what does that mean? There is a community of uh, people who are just fascinated uh, by the Battle of the Alamo. We also call them Alamo fanboys. <laughs> we, also call them Al- uh, we also Mostly call boys. them... No, no there, no, there no. are a number of, of, of ladies okay. as well. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in their sight. That's that's right. And uh, they are fascinated uh, by this uh, battle. In the same way, you have uh, aficionados of the Titanic. The Supreme Court. That yes. are, uh, you know, so. Uh, Something important. Yeah, they're they're Alamo heads. They're <laughs> Alamo heads. Are, oh. are I sometimes call them my Mo Bros. Mo Bros. My Mo Bros. That's kind of sexist. <laughs> it is kind of sexist. Okay, but we'll go with it. We'll, we'll let okay. it slide right now. At least I will let it okay. slide. I don't know if our audience I'm will. I'm highly offended. Yeah, okay, good. So, um, But they're all good people. I, they're all good people. They're all good people. Now, we're going to start with something real basic here. I, sure. I'm a Californian. Okay. Okay, born and raised in California. Spent the first 30-something years of my life in California. And the Alamo was like something that happened out in Texas. But yeah. so what? Why should anybody care about the Alamo? Forgive me, I'm going to just play ignorant. Sure. Please, you Texans, you need to explain this to me so it makes sense. Well, it it is a little in Congress, and I I admit that. Uh, You would think the big deal would be the redemption at uh, San Jacinto. I think that would be the big. You would think yeah. the big oh, win. Okay, for for the again, those of us from outside of Texas, yeah. <laughs> in other words, ninety nine percent of the population of the world. Yeah. What's San Jacinto? Okay, so, uh, I, so so there's more than one thing going on. Okay, here. the Battle of San Jacinto fought on April twenty first, eighteen thirty six. Uh, the occasion where uh, Texian forces under Texian. Texian that's what. We called ourselves at that time. Texan actually doesn't come into vogue until after statehood. Uh, In in fact, Texians were so new on the scene, nobody knew quite what to call them. And in in fact, there were a number of uh, candidates, uh, Texican uh, was (laughs) a possible. Texican, yeah. They come back around. Uh, Texonian, Texonian, uh, Texasian. I don't, Texasian. I don't like that one. <laughs> and uh, and my favorite, Texalingian. Texalingian. It so, sounds like a body part. I well, it, it's, no, it's it's kind of like I contracted in the Philippines. It's kind of like Carolingian. If you're a, a, a fan of, of, of Charlemagne and his no, not nope. a fan of them okay, either. Okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry. You're gonna have to keep but, trying. Uh, Actually, like when you when you consider all the options, Texian is 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 not bad. It's not bad, but but that was same the, that's lost in history. Yeah. But anyway, but at any rate, these folks uh, defeated uh, the Mexican dictator uh, Antonio Lopez de Santana at the Battle of San Jacinto, April twenty first, and uh, really uh, didn't ensure Texas independence, as is often claimed. Because uh, even after that disastrous defeat, uh, Mexico, the Mexican Congress, did not surrender their claim on Texas. They insisted, continued to insist, that uh, 
Texas was still part of Mexico and that the uh, Republic of uh, Texas was illegitimate. And someday, uh, when uh, permission or when the conditions permitted, uh, they were going to reclaim Texas. If you take a look at Mexican textbooks, it's referred to as the secession of Texas. Whoa. So it's an interesting yeah. movie. Have, they, have they ever renounced uh, their claim? Yes, but it had a lot more to do, uh, finally, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. They conceded that, yes, Texas is yours. It's now part of the oh. United States. But, but that had a lot more to do with the fact that... Uh, when Phil Scott uh, was occupying Mexico City, mm -hmm. than anything that ha had happened on the banks of Buffalo Bayou, what twelve years before? Yeah, correct. Okay, now, 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 th that's the redemption. That's the redemption. Now you. Now that. Now, 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 having said all that, uh, that's not a big deal in Texas. What the big deal is is it, a losing battle. Is a catastrophic defeat that. Uh, uh, happened seven weeks before in the suburbs of uh, San Antonio de Bear. And uh, here in Texas, that's kind of our creation myth. And uh, in fact, uh, I've en entitled my next book, the book that's currently in press, uh, I call it Lust for Glory, an epic tale of early Texas and the sacrifice that defined a nation. Now, the na Which nation? Well, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, it is not. It is not uh, the uh, United States of America. I was. I was wondering. Uh, it is another sovereign nation, the Republic of Texas. Uh, the Republic of Texas existed as uh, its own nation uh, for a decade, from uh, 1836 to 1846, at which time. Uh, we joined the Federal Union. Now, this is probably getting ahead of ourselves. Yes. We've got a lot to cover, but yeah. why did Texas, if they fought for independence, then choose to join the United States? Well, this is something that we Texans uh, dislike admitting. But really, uh, the experiment in independence was a failure. We, we were a failed... What? Wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Don't act so shocked. I've heard of something called the Bear Flag Republic, which was a sham out in California. Yes. They declared their independence. That's then, correct. We did. And then said, oh, did we say independence? We meant we're a state. state. That's right. And we got a lot of gold, too, but yeah, people are going to come right. and see us. Yeah. What does Texas have? Does Texas have a lot of gold? We well, eventually had all yeah. oil, but... Yeah. yeah. Sooner or later. Black, black, black gold. Us. Black gold. Yeah. yeah. Texas tea. Yeah. So, so <laughs> Texas tea. Yeah. So, well, you never watched the, the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Actually, no, I didn't. Oh uh, well, you know, again, there, the California. You, there, you <laughs> there you go. There you go. You can't be trusted at all. What do you even do here? <laughs> Good question. But, you know, those California shows, you know, they start someplace else, and we don't care the start myth, you know, oh, the okay. starting myth. That's so that's anyway, so why again did Texas join the United States? We got diverted by California. Well, a sad uh, re remember, remember what I, I, I said earlier about uh, Mexico refusing to uh, recognize the independence of Texas. A lot of it w was for reasons of security. Uh -huh. uh, the, if we joined the United States, the United States Army would protect us from Mexican encroachments. That's one reason. Uh, there are many. Uh, we were bankrupt. Our money, uh, although uh, while it was very beautiful, uh, was worthless. And uh, uh, generally, very few people had any confidence. And, and for all of our fighting prowess, our uh, supposed fighting prowess, uh, most of our military campaigns were disasters. Dis absolute uh, disaster. The, the Santa Fe expedition, oh gosh, the Mier expedition, just just terrible. So, so uh, we had a regular army, but we couldn't afford it. And, had a regular navy and couldn't afford couldn't it. Afford so we leased it to Yucatan. Yeah, you know what we could afford. Now this is an interesting. You know what okay, we and we've got about a minute left. Okay. Unfortunately, so okay. No, no, no. This is quick. What we could afford were 
Texas Rangers. And we could afford them because they didn't wear any fancy uniforms. They rode their own horses. They wore their own clothes. Work cheap. Work cheap. Uh, and as it turned out, were a lot more efficient as Indian fighters than the regular Army guys. So uh, that... Uh, so something good took uh, so, place during uh, Absolutely. This time. A, a number of good things came out of the Republic of Texas. Uh, and I would argue that it was annexed to protect the institution of slavery. Oh, bringing in a whole other dimension yeah. to this thing. Absolutely. Okay, now unfortunately we are going to have to take a break. No, that's fortunate. Because we yeah. want to hear from our sponsors. We do want to hear from our sponsors. I apologize for that. And then we want to hear more from you, Dr. Steve Harton. Uh, and we can make that happen. We can. And when we come back, we also want to know what books you've written. Okay. For our listening and viewing audience out there. But we've got four seconds. So we'll return shortly. And we're back, and this is Paul Fabrizio, and... I'm Don Frazier. We're the professors here... At the campus of McMurray University in beautiful Abilene, Texas. Correct, correct. And we are celebrating the Texas High Holy Days, an expression I never heard of until recently. With our high priest of the Texas High Holy oh, Days. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> and Steve Scott Martin. the engineer, too. You know, yeah. I have a... It was a Texian if I've ever seen one. Don't feel bad. I didn't know about the High Holy Days, really, until I started hanging out with those two. So, yeah, it was kind of a new thing for me also. So it's not something they teach in school. Yeah, they don't teach you about the High Holy Days. They teach you about the Alamo, but not the High Holy Days down there, yes. Okay. One of, one of my friends in San Antonio who is uh, uh, an Alamo enthusiast uh, was talking to a friend of hers on the telephone, and then she made some reference to the High Holy Days. And her friend said, well, Joan, I didn't know you were Jewish. And uh, she had to explain to her that, no, uh, she she wasn't. But, uh, you know, so, yeah. so okay. don't, don't, don't feel bad. Okay. You're, you're, you're not the only one who's never... Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty esoteric term, actually. <laughs> but I love the term, so. Yeah. 
So, well, well I, I suppose we should define the term. Uh, that's a great idea. Well, normally it's that period beginning at uh, February 23rd, uh, February 23rd, which is the day the siege, the 13-day siege of the Alamo began. That's when the Mexicans arrived on uh, in, in, in San Antonio. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it ends on March 6th uh, when the uh, fort falls. Now, most years, that's only 12 days. Uh, but in 1836, it was 13, 13 days. Can you imagine why? Leap year. It was, 1836 was a leap year. And on the 7th of March, they held a big barbecue, if I understand correctly. No, actually, that began on the afternoon, about 5 o'clock on March 6th. Yeah. And, and those, continued on. Uh, for two days. Yeah. That's a big barbecue. That is a big burn. <laughs> okay, Dr. Harden, before we go any further, let's just establish <laughs> let's just establish some of the things you've done. You, you've written some interesting books. Why don't you t briefly tell us about your books? And well, I, I don't know if they're interesting or not, but my first book was a, a little book called The Texas Rangers. Uh, in uh, a innovative yeah. title that, yeah. and it's about, wait for it, the Texas Rangers. Not the baseball club. I'd Not say. the baseball club, the paramilitary organization and law enforcement group. Uh, then uh, probably the book for which I am most known uh, came out in 1994, Texian Iliad, mm -hmm. a military history of the Texas Revolution. Uh, then I wrote a little book called uh, The Alamo 1836, Santana's Texas Campaign. And then I wrote, uh, actually, it's an editing job. It's called Lone Star, the Republic of Texas. It's a compilation of uh, primary accounts, uh, and I, I introduce each one of these with a little introductory essay. Okay. Uh, and then in uh, uh, 2007, uh, with the help of... Uh, Don and other people at the State House Press. I published a book called Taxi and Macabre. That's my favorite. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's my favorite too. Yeah. I think it's the best book I've ever written. And uh, the subtitle of that book is a, Mel a Melancholy Tale of a Hanging in Early Houston. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on another book now, which is a uh, kind of a, an episodic history of the heroic age in Texas history, that period from 1821 to 1846. And that's lust for glory. Okay, 1846, of course, was when Texas gave it all up and that, surrendered to that, the United States. That's correct. When they were jointly annexed. Jointly annexed. Okay, very good. So let's go back to the Alamo. Mm -hmm. What happened? All I know is Davy Crockett was there. He was. And he apparently got killed. He did. And everybody lost, and it's celebrated to this day for well, some Well, and... Uh, is, is that a good summary from a California perspective? From a California perspective, yeah. Well, it, but, but you, you, you hit on a salient point. The, the, reason, the reason we remember the Alamo is because it was a last stand. Okay. Every Texian defender was killed. Now, last stands have mythic power. Yes, they do. Uh, the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae, uh, Custer at the Little Bighorn, uh, last stands. Uh, and now, now Bunch the of losses. All over the place. <laughs> well, that's Custer doesn't hold that, it that's uh, that's right. I mean, it's catastrophic losses, but but. The fact that everybody died lends moral power to that episode. Now, the irony is, at the end of the Battle of the Alamo, mm -hmm. General Manuel Castrillon brought six, well, five, six, or seven prisoners to Santana. And he said, Your Excellency, I present you with these prisoners. He said, Why? I told you I didn't want any prisoners. Kill them. And Whoa. everybody is standing around going, Well, we're not going to kill uh, helpless men. We, we don't do that. But his staff officers, men who had not personally participated in the battle themselves, drew their swords and fell upon these helpless men and well, hacked them to pieces. 
Really? Yeah. Now, uh, the preponderance of evidence was that among the slain prisoners was David Crockett, a uh, congressman from Tennessee. Uh, and that causes heartburn for a lot of people, but I, you know. But, but why, it, why, why, why would why? that cause heartburn? He didn't go down fighting? He, yeah, because okay. those of us of a certain age who, who grew up watching the Disney show, the Disney version, because he, he, was, he, he, fighting, got, he, you know, he was swinging his rifle. And that, that image became icon to an entire generation of baby boomers. And if you tell them that Davy didn't go down swinging old Betsy, that that's a real assault on on their boyhood hero. Well, they need to get over it. You know, I'm well, sorry. I agree. Again, California. I, I agree. I agree. So he went swinging, and then he got arrested, yeah. and then he got, he got stabbed. Yeah. You know, I mean, you I mean, think about it. He's a 50 year old pop failed politician. <laughs> What's he going to try to do? Talk his way out of it? Yeah, exactly. But Paul, here's here's the <laughs> irony. Out the back door. Who, me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was just here to pick up some tacos. Yeah. So so, uh, Paul, here's 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 a delicious irony. Please. Because <laughs> I said taco. He said if, delicious. If Santana had been willing just to take a few prisoners, we would remember this episode today as a catastrophic defeat. Uh, Hollywood would not want to make movies about it. We, we, we would not, you know, there would not be Alamo uh, aficionados. It wouldn't be a high holidays. But because it was a last stand, now understand these people did not fight to to the death, Santana ordered every Texan killed. Their execution. So, so he, it was Santana who made this a last stand uh, and uh, gave it its moral power. Don't ever wipe out your enemy to the last man. <laughs> Always leave somebody. Always with, leave somebody alive. Lesson. So, so it's just a overwhelming defeat a crushing defeat and, and we, we, we'll, we'll discuss this when we come back for our next after our next whatever we're gonna have a break and then we'll okay. discuss this further because i'm just curious about what you just brought up so we'll talk about that very soon
And we're back. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier. And we're the professors here at McMurray University in Abilene, Texas. And we're talking about the high holy days in Texas history with our guest, Dr. Steve Harden, professor of history at McMurray University and author of many books on Texas history. And to his right is our distinguished engineer, Scott. And so if anything goes Hello, wrong, Indian. we blame Scott. Now... <laughs> I, I, thanks, I'm used to it. Yeah. He's the chief javelin catcher. Now, before the break, we were talking about the Alamo and how the fact that General Santana ordered the execution of several Texas prisoners, possibly including David Crockett, as you called him, as, as opposed to Davey Crockett, for those of us who watch TV. Well, uh, can I speak to that? Please. Davey Crockett is a creation of folklore. Uh -huh. uh, so when I'm talking, and, and this is a convention that Crockett scholars use, when we're talking about the folkloric figure, he's Davy. But when we're talking about the real fre flesh and blood historical figure, he's David because in his own life, he uh, always signed his name David and seemingly never encouraged anyone to call him Davy. So that's... That's a, fascinating. Yeah. So, so when you talk about the folkloric mm -hmm. Davy, when did that start? Did that go uh, right it, back it, to the uh, battle itself? No, no, that actually began before his death. Really? You know, we talk about a living legend. Well, he was one. And even in his own lifetime, they were publishing the Crockett Almanacs. And it has a political angle mm -hmm. because Andy Jackson was the homespun frontier hero. Yes. And the Whigs needed their own homespun frontier uh, hero. And so they kind of recruited him into the Whig camp, or certainly the anti-Jackson camp. And also from the same state of Tennessee. That's right. right. And so they said, hey, you got your rough, spun, rough homespun hero, we have ours. How much of David Crockett's real life was reflected in the folklore? Quite a bit, uh, because he, he was a hunter. He claimed to have killed 500 bears in one season, which is a notable achievement. That's a lot of bears. <laughs> yeah. Do we believe him? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of bears. Okay. Uh, Not so much anymore, but <laughs> in his city. <laughs> You're born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. Right? <laughs> you know, Paul, some people have said that uh, David Crockett was uh, the first American celebrity. Uh, wow. By which they mean he was famous for being famous. He was the Kardashian of his day? Yeah, kind of, because, you oh, know, if you look at his... <laughs> Here comes the hate mail. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you, if you look at his achievements, he, he didn't accomplish a lot in Congress, uh, but he was enormously affable. He was enormously entertaining. Quotable. Uh, quotable, and uh, but in terms of... You know, what he did, he didn't really do that much, which is why if he had not been killed at the Alamo, he would have been a footnote. But his death at the Alamo uh, assured his place in the canon of uh, American heroes. So what drew him from Tennessee to Texas? Well, the fact that he had lost an election. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to escape. Uh, Give the concession speech. Please. Well, as he as he famously told his constituents, if you uh, choose a man with a timber toe over me, his uh, opponent had a wooden leg. <laughs> a timber toe. He said, if you choose a man with a timber toe over me, you can go to hell, and, what? and I will go to Texas. That's the best concession speech ever. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. He yeah. was not happy about losing, was he? No, no because he felt that the uh, Jackson machine had caused it to, to be a rigged election. You think it was? Nah. He just think he, he, he wasn't just, as good just, as his opponent. He just lost. He, he just, just lost. lost. So Well, and, and, and come on, in Tennessee, you 
go against Andrew Jackson, that was political suicide. So he ended up going to Texas, but why to the Alamo? Was he just looking for adventure? Well, was he drunk? No. Was he sent no, there on a no. suicide mission? No, 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 no. Nobody at the Alamo believed they were going to die. That's another part of the myth. Uh, they went there to hold the fort. And that had been the plan all along. In 1836, San Antonio stood on the far southern frontier of Texas. And the plan was to hold the San Antonio River line. Mm -hmm. There were two forts, uh, one the Alamo at San Antonio and the Presidio La Bahia at Goliad. Mm -hmm. And two roads come up from the Mexican interior and one goes through San Antonio and one goes through Goliad. So think of those as arteries. And the interior road tougher to traverse mm -hmm. and tougher to supply. It's the coast road. And, okay. and, and the plan is to put skeleton garrisons down there at those forts. And when they see a Mexican army barreling up this road, they'll sing out, they're coming. The rest of the Texians mm -hmm. will siphon down to these vital choke points and we'll hold the enemy on the frontier. We will not allow them to penetrate into the Texian settlements. Good plan. Yeah. So why didn't it work? Well, this is another thing Texans don't like to admit. <laughs> but the provisional government that should have and could have uh, organized relief efforts to, to go to the Alamo had fallen apart. Oh no. In dissension and discord. And and nobody really minded because they knew that there was going to be a constitutional convention at Washington on the Brazos in early March and they were probably going to declare independence and create a new government and so and then that would be fine. Unfortunately, remember when I told you that Santana arrived in in San Antonio, that was February the 23rd. So during this interim period where Texas really didn't have a government, uh, uninvited company <laughs> arrives. Yeah, because they really weren't looking for them before April or May. Right? No. Yeah. So this guy just popped his head up over the, the and wall goes, one day and here said, Here I am. Oh. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> what are those guys and, doing here? And let's, let's, give credit where credit is due. One of the things that Santana could do was raise and march uh, an army uh, mm -hmm. very quickly. Rapidiamundo. And uh, in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he uh, achieved, as we say in, in military history circles, he achieved strategic surprise. He stole a march and arrived well, months uh, before they thought he could. Meanwhile, well, I, Texas I, I, is chasing its tail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so check, Texas didn't have a functioning government. In essence. No, they couldn't. Therefore, resupply the people that they sent out to man these forts. So, that's here exactly comes right. Santa Ana, and they go, "Hi, what do we do now?" And all of a sudden, are they trapped? Could they? Escape? They are trapped. They are trapped. And and if you and if you read uh, Travis's famous letter of February the twenty fourth, the ones that. You know, we used to have to memorize in, in school. Not in, in California. Not in, California. Not, not in, <laughs> in Texas, we had to, to memorize it. But it, it says, uh, you know, I'm besieged. And uh, he's losing his voice. He's getting choked up over this. So we got how many minutes? Two minutes or so? Minutes. Two minutes. So he's besieged. And he says, uh, you know, come to my aid with all dispatch. So far from being someone with a death wish, he's saying, look, they're here. Uh, and you're not. And get over yeah, here. Get over here. And Come then on we down got this thing. And, and help us. Yeah. But, we'll, show up, we'll but we will it. hold the fort till you get here. Yeah. And, and, you know, we should be able to do that. But nobody's saying, yes, we are going to immolate ourselves on the altar of freedom. There's nothing better than going to paradise. They're, they're, they're <laughs> hoping to avoid that. Thank you very much. Was there any relief? coming to these people in the Alamo? Uh, and, yes. Uh, 32 men from Gonzales cut their way into the fort. Uh, that wasn't nearly enough. How many did Santa Ana have? 
Well, uh, that's something. He had a little over 7,000 men <laughs> in his army, yeah, in his army, places, and that army is strung out uh, along the march. He didn't have all 7,000 people in uh, in San Antonio. In he had fact, more than 150. <laughs> well, he did, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, in the final assault, how many Mexican assault troops are attacking the walls? Uh about 1,800. Oh, my. Those, I mean, those, uh, those Texians had no chance. Well, no. No, no. they didn't. Say. Now, when we come back, because we have to take another break. When we come back, I want to hear about the women that were in okay. the Alamo, because I don't recall seeing anything about that in the TV show okay. that Disney told us. So thank you very much. We'll return shortly. And we're back for our final segment of The Professors. I'm Paul Fabrizio. I'm Don Frazier. This is my friend Steve Harden. Hi, Steve. Greetings. And the guy down there. Scott the Engineer. He's Hello. all our friend. He makes <laughs> us look good. Thank you. He needs some work on that, though. Anyway. <laughs> all right. So. Can't <laughs> fix ugly, man. I'm just saying. Steve Harden, we're talking about the Alamo, the High Holy Days. We've covered and you've destroyed for me the myth of david crockett not davy and now apparently there's women at the alamo and that was not in the davy crockett tv show from disney so please explain well there are about 14 non-combatant women and children children too children too and uh, uh during the 13-day siege they are ensconced in the sacristy of the Alamo Church. And uh, even though the Alamo Church was roofless, the sacristy did have a roof, and it was generally considered to be bomb-proof. Uh, and it probably was the safest place for them. What were they there for? Well, they were... In many cases, the wives 
uh, and children of, of the defenders. Uh, remember, uh, San Antonio is a vibrant, active town. And when Santana appeared on the 23rd, uh, you know, entire families uh, went into the Alamo. Well, and this is also a Mexican Civil War. It, it is and indeed. And so, I mean, that kind of wraps up everybody. So Santana is a centralist, mm-hmm. and he's fighting federalist. And some of the Tejanos are federalist, and they know that their f- families will suffer at the hands of the centralist, which had just moved into town. So they went there for protection. Yes. Right? And, and remember, everybody's expecting that the rest of Texas is going to hurry down to the relief uh, of the Alamo. So, so what happened to these women and children? Did <coughs> they get killed? Uh, some of them did, yes. Uh, Do you remember their names? Yeah, well, the ones that were killed? Yeah. No, I don't think the children that are uh, that were killed were identified, but there is Enrique Esparza. Well, let's let's go back. There's mm. Gregorio Esparza is an Alamo defender. Anna Esparza is his wife, and their children. Uh, one of whom is Enrique Esparza. He's about ten years old in uh, in uh, 1836. He survives the final assault, he and his mother and all of his siblings. And as a very old man, well, I say very old man, he must have been about my age. That's Uh, very old. That's very old, yes. Uh, He, uh, an insignia, uh, he gives uh, his memories to a San Antonio newspaper. And he says, this is what I remember about being a kid during the Alamo. And he actually, he's... It's a, it's a very interesting account, but in, in Enrique Esparza's account, he, he talks about uh, children my age who are involved in the fighting and, and who are killed. There's a black woman killed. Yes. At the Alamo. That's, that's a, probably the, boy, the, the girlfriend of one of the defenders. Yeah, that's a fascinating What's story. What's her name? Uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, she, Sarah is a slave in uh, New Orleans. Uh, she is mulatto. She mm-hmm. is uh, biracial, mm-hmm. but a slave nonetheless. And uh, a, a Texian uh, named uh, uh, Patrick Henry Herndon uh, goes to New Orleans. They meet. Uh, we, we don't really know what their relationship is. But when uh, Patrick Henry Herndon goes back to Texas, Sarah is with him. Is with him. And the only reason, and, and, and God bless her master, he filed suit against Herndon for running off with his <coughs> property. His property. Oh and if it hadn't been for that lawsuit, we would, have, we would know none of this. But... Uh, Robert Herndon, uh, Robert, I'm sorry, Patrick Henry Herndon uh, is an Alamo defender. And Joe, uh, who is Travis's body servant, who also survived, uh, says that there is a, he sees a black woman, dead, a dead black woman lying uh, between two cannon. Now, now, what we what we think is that this uh, African American woman who was killed at the Alamo was the well, we don't know what the relationship, but we we think it may have been a love relationship, and she may have been helping Patrick Henry Herndon man that cannon and was caught in the crossfire. The Molly Pitcher of the Alamo, except yeah. she gets killed. Yeah. How how come? We don't have like schools named after these women and these well, children. because we've just this is cutting edge stuff. Yeah, this is pretty new. This is pretty. I mean, and we've just pieced the the Sarah story together. Uh, is she she's about to be recognized in a big way? Good. Uh, in this uh, uh, computer program, I've I've been working on for about six months now. Now, have you seen any of the political advertising bringing it back to your realm? 
Uh, that George P. Bush is running? George P. Bush, land commissioner, is running, and he's talking about defending the Alamo. He's saving the Alamo. Yes, absolutely. indeed. And obviously there's a big story behind that, and unfortunately we have less than two minutes, so we don't have time to get into that. But I do want to say one other thing. You were a movie historian way, on an Alamo movie. Correct? Yeah, back way back in 2003, uh, they made a... Uh, big Hollywood feature film called The Alamo. It was directed by John Lee Hancock. It starred uh, Billy Bob Thornton as uh, David Crockett. We, we, got David. That, we got that right. Uh, and uh, I, I was the historical advisor on that film. And, and is, is it a, an accurate film of what took place, uh, or did Hollywood still... Well... Uh, it is more accurate than any other Alamo film, but there are a few Hollywood moments in there, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to have you back because you have a virtual reality, augmented reality. Augmented reality. Augmented Not reality. Right. I'm told there's a difference. There but, is okay. a difference. big difference. And by the time you come back, you're going to explain that difference to us. I'll try. Okay. I, I, and we might even be able to demo some of it. Well, I hope so. On the air. Or certainly in post. Okay, very good. And if nothing else, I can give you the website so you can see what we're talking about. But okay. It, it'll give you an immediacy of, you know, you were there, which is kind of cool. So I can imagine being in the battle. Well, you'll be on site, and you'll imagine what it would have oh, looked cool. like back at the time. Well, you so. know, you, you won't imagine anything. We're going to put you in the center of the action. Ooh. All right, so there's the teaser for the next time we have wow, Steve back. Oh, that is great. Okay, our thanks to Stephen yeah, Hart and Dr. Stephen. I know you're coming all the way up to speed. No, I'm fine. Yeah. And we're going to be back another time. Thank you.